What's cracking, big dope? Welcome back to the HQ. Welcome back to the channel. I am Nicholas. You are watching BDGE. Big dogs got to eat fantasy football. It's Friday, so we're jumping into a 2019 fantasy football mock draft. We're doing a, a live fantasy football draft, pretty much. And this is going to be done on draft.com, as we've been doing every Friday, and we will be doing throughout the summer. So what I got to do is create the draft on draft.com. They have a great app, great website. Obviously, I'm going to be doing it on the website. Um, and I do these drafts with my subscribers, with my audience. So if you want to take part in one of the Friday videos, go sign up on draft.com. If you use my promo code BDGE, you will get $3 to draft with. Absolutely free. And then add me. My username is Nick Ercolano, and I will add you back. And then once I do these videos, and I do other drafts throughout the week that aren't filmed or televised, um, I will send the invites out to you. So I'm about to hit create, and we will wait for this to fill up. We'll wait for that to fill up. I'll join it in here. Um, and for those, of you, uh, for those of you guys that are unfamiliar with Draft.com, this is a best ball draft. Okay, that shit just filled up in about 0.5 seconds. I tell you, baby, the clout is real. 2019 fantasy football, big dogs gotta eat, is taken over. We got the ninth spot. It automatically generates once 10 people jump into the draft. So Draft.com, again, is a best ball draft. So these are actually not mock drafts. We are actually playing for money. This is only a $1 buy-in. But if you come on, use the promo code, you'll get $3, deposit 10 bucks, and you can do 10 mock drafts throughout the next couple months. And the best part about this is the buy-ins are anywhere from a dollar up to like $1,000. So if you want to do more high stakes, fantastic. If you want to do a dollar draft, they have them here. The best part about doing dollar drafts is you're really not risking anything, but everyone takes it seriously, right? Because they put their money in. They don't want to start taking defenses and kickers early even though you literally can't even take them in here, so I don't know why I'm bringing them up, but um, all the drafts are taken seriously. So the ADPs and the rankings and stuff and the practice that you get are very realistic to what you're going to see in the draft. And that's the best part about this um, this app, this website, draft.com. Super aesthetic, awesome to play. So a lot of the picks and stuff are going to be very... Um, they'll mirror what will go on in your regular season-long draft. The only difference in best ball is that you don't actually make waiver wire moves and you don't decide who to sit and start. It automatically starts the best players at each position each week. It's one quarterback, two running backs, three wide receivers, one tight end. You draft 18 players, so it's a big roster because, again, you don't make trades, you don't make waiver wire pickups. You have one team for the entire year, but again, you don't choose who to start. So there are guys like, you know, Deshaun Jackson or whatever that make big splash plays. Hard to hard to decide when to start them. But since it does it automatically for you, um, those guys are a little bit more valuable. So that's the only thing that I think that might mess a little bit with the ADP or the rankings. But otherwise, it's pretty typical. So um, we're seeing a lot of the same things happen in the early on draft, right? This is the first time you're tuning into a 2019 fantasy football draft. The top four picks in no particular order are pretty much every single time Saquon Barkley, Alvin Kamara, Zeke, and McCaffrey, depending on, you know, uh, preferences. But those are the top four consensus picks, it seems like. After that, it's kind of up for grabs, to be honest with you. Um, in my personal opinion, and my rankings will be dropping in my draft guide, which comes out on July 1st, Barkley is my 101. Um, Kamara and C-Mac are, are right there as well. So I, I really couldn't be upset about taking either of those guys over Saquon Barkley. I think Kamara has shown us his floor of 80 receptions in a high-powered offense. C-Mac showed us that he's not just a, a pass catcher last year. He you know carried the ball 200-plus times uh, and ran spectacularly. A, a lot of touchdowns, a lot of yardage. was breaking home run plays after you know averaging whatever, like 3.8 yards a carry the year before. So we've literally had eight running backs go off the board so far. Barkley, Kamara, Zeke, C-Mac, Melvin Gordon, Todd Gurley, David Johnson, Le'Veon Bell. So I'm sitting here at the nine, and I'm not going to take a running back for the sake of taking a running back. Although, Joe Mixon is pretty much my... Him, him and Dalvin Cook are like my RB6-7 in that range, and I would probably take him here. Um, and I'm going to go with Mixon because I don't think I'll be able to get Mixon on the way back. I have the ninth pick again. This is a 10-team half PPR. You don't take kickers. You don't take defense. 
So I went with Mixon there because I don't think I was going to be able to get Mixon on, on the way back on the second pick. But I could have went with like a D-Hop or a Devonta Adams. However, I know I'll be able to get one of the elite wide receivers on my second pick here, right? So in my opinion, like if you're if you're picking at the, the late end, the late end, what the fuck am I saying? If you're picking it in the back end of the first round, like I am here, um... I think it's okay to go with a running back that might be in a in a lesser tier or even like a Travis Kelsey here because the delta between not picking like DeAndre Hopkins at the 109 but still be able to being able to get like uh, Devonta Adams or Julio Jones like I'm about to get right now I got Devonta Adams uh, the the fall off the drop off is not significant whatsoever right a lot of people would argue that Devonta Adams is the wide receiver one over DeAndre Hopkins uh, either way the, the gap is not not far off. Um, even if they had gone with Devonta Adams instead of Kelsey and he was off the board, the drop off between Hopkins, Adams to, you know, Odell or Julio, Michael Thomas, Juju, like any of those guys really is not that far. But if I had taken one of those guys and then banked on, you know, Joe Mixon being there at the 112 or the 202, excuse me, it probably wouldn't have happened. So when I'm at the back end of the first round, uh, I, I look at it that way. Like you always have to, you always have to draft in these tiers, man. And I just don't think there's a. While I do think like D Hop is my wide receiver one, and he is technically in his tier of his own. Uh, I, I don't think like the drop off from that tier to the other five guys that are right after him are really that significant. Where you need to make sure you get him over the next wide receiver, if that makes sense. So we're seeing a ton of running backs go off the board, super, super, super early, super often. So, it, you know, the way these things work, the way fantasy works is we get excited about something each year and then eventually things swing back to the norm. And this year, going into this year at least, you know, we're, I feel like there are a lot more workhorse running backs um, than in previous years, right? Like you always wanted one of the top half of the first round picks in the previous years because there were only like four or five workhorse running backs. Like you could make an argument that Literally all the the first nine guys that went off the board in this draft, Barkley, Kamara, Zeke, McCaffrey, Gordon, Gurley, Johnson, Bell, Mixon, uh, are all the respective workhorses, like literally three down backs featured in their offenses. Like there's not many years you go into an NFL season, especially in today's day and age where multiple running backs are being used all the time, that you're really confident that one guy is, you know, like basically that's almost a third of the NFL using a featured workhorse back. By the time next year's draft comes around, I guarantee you half of these guys are cut off and half of these guys bust and we'll be back to a point where it's only like four guys that are really featured backs or something like that. So zig when people zag. Obviously, it's a lot easier said in theory than doing because it takes a lot of risk to zig when we zag, right? Uh, but but in terms of you know some of the guys that went off the board in the first couple rounds, let's uh, let, let's break down some players. So Zeke, Zeke right now, I love Zeke. I love what we saw from him once Amari Cooper came over to the team, right? The splits were ridiculous. He was on pace over the last eight games of the season for like over 2,000 yards from scrimmage, 70 catches, whatever. But now we have this like weird little thing where Zeke was at EDC, Electronic Dance Carnival or whatever the C stands for in that shit. It's like a dance festival. And uh, there's video of him like pushing a security guard and him getting handcuffed. Nothing, no, no legal actions actually came of it. But... Uh, the NFL is going to look into it. And Zeke obviously has, do I think that anything should happen from it? No, I think it was dumb. I think it, they should move on from it, but it's Zeke and it's the NFL and they'll do what they want. And uh, he has a history. So they might just ding him for no fucking reason other than that, that he's Zeke and they're the NFL. Um, so do I think he should get anything? Fuck no. But is it possible that he gets a one or two game suspension? Yeah, unfortunately it is. So by default, I think, you know, he's such a solid pick in fantasy, but just having that red flag makes him the 104 for me when the other three guys really don't have many red flags. I know Saquon Barkley has some red flags there, but like he's just way too talented to to pass up. And then we had Gurley go off at tops uh, at running back six guys. And uh, I don't know like how many more times you need to see reports about his knee being a problem, but Gurley needs to not be anywhere near the first round uh, of fantasy drafts this year. The knee is absolutely a problem. We're not going to see him at all in the preseason. I, I would be I would be shocked if he really worked anything throughout the OTAs. I would be shocked if he got a single carry in the preseason. Um, and then his workload is going to be quite 
a significant drop off from what we've seen in previous years. So uh, I'm completely fading Gurley anywhere near the top two rounds. And then we have, um, and this is something I'm seeing more and more of happen with the tight ends. We saw Kelsey go at the 2 1. Zach Ertz go at the 210, and Kittle actually dropped to 3 4. So Kittle dropped to the third round, something I haven't really been seeing much of. So I'm up right now at the 3 9. I took one running back, I took one wide receiver. And in these instances, I'm not really necessarily concerned about like filling up a certain number of each position. Um, so I will always take the best player available on the board. I don't like Devonta Freeman, you guys know that. Uh, I kind of like Damian Williams here. I'm going to go with Williams. Uh, I think he's a good best ball pick as well, just because, like, sure, at, at the end of the season, he might not have stayed as the feature back. Like, he might not go the full 16 games as a feature back for Kansas City, but I think he's going to give you at least, like, eight games as their workhorse. Um, and those are super valuable in a best ball league, where you're going to have five or six running backs, if not seven on your roster, to back him up in those games where maybe he's not getting, you know, 20 touches. Maybe he drops down to 12 touches a game and he splits shit with Carlos Hyde and Darwin Thompson or James Williams or whatever. Um, both exciting guys, these rookies, Darwin Thompson, James Williams. For those of you guys who don't know him, Darwin Thompson was a kid who was like a Juco transfer to Utah State. Absolutely blew up in his last year at Utah State. Again, still low competition, but he's a kid that could do it all. He is undersized. He's not very athletic, but like I, I subjectively really liked him when I watched the film. Um, but it's up to you to kind of decide that. So I went with Damian Williams at 3-9. Carryon Johnson, Aaron Jones went off at 3-10, 4-1. I would have went with Carryon Johnson had he have been there. Um, and, and it's tough kind of picking at these spots because because um, obviously, you, you, I mean, not necessarily you have to reach, but of course you're not picking again for like 20 spots. And Keenan Allen is a guy that I don't have a lot of stock of. So I do a ton of these best ball drafts, guys. Like, I've probably done 50, 60, maybe 70 already, which is, I know, probably fucking nuts for a lot of you guys. But I'm starting them all the time. So again, guys, if, if you're not on draft.com or if you haven't added me yet, do that. Draft.com slash BDGE. Use the promo code BDGE. You'll get $3 to draft with. Dra uh, throw $10 on your account, and you'll be able to get into some of the drafts with me. Just add my username. It's right here, Nick Ercolano. I'll add you all back, and I'll add you when I draft. So I do a lot of these best ball drafts, and I say the same thing when I'm doing season-long drafts, too. Um, I'm in probably five or six redraft leagues each year, so season-longs. I know I know the majority of you guys are probably only in one, two, maybe three leagues, but as soon as I get past, like, two leagues, if I'm in three leagues or more, one of, one of my biggest tips to you guys is to diversify your teams. When you go into a year... You know, you're going to have strong convictions. You might not have strong convictions on everyone, but you're going to have strong convictions on, let's say, 25% of the NFL players. You're going to have strong convictions on another 25%. You know, 25 in terms of you love these guys, 25% in terms of you hate these guys. The middle guys uh, will probably fall to one of your three teams just due to value because you're not fading them, you're not targeting them. So you'll end up with a good plethora and a good mix of players in the middle rounds. But the guys you absolutely hate, you're probably going to fade you know, every single time. The guys you love, you're going to target every single time. The problem with that strategy is that you have to understand that you're going to be wrong about a lot of shit. And you have to have some humility. This, this is just for life as well, man. This ain't just fantasy football. But learn to have some humility. Learn that, understand that the convictions that you have going into a season are not going to be 100% right. You're probably going to flip a coin and go 50-50 on guys you love and guys you hate being wrong and right. So what I would do is if you've noticed you faded one guy for the majority of your leagues... You know, if you're in four leagues, you faded Derrick Henry in three of them. I'm giving you literally an example of what's probably going to happen with me. I faded him in three of them. I'm going to draft him in the fourth one because I understand that I hate him. I want no part of him. But if I'm wrong, it's 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 going to hurt big time because if I'm wrong, that means he probably ends up as a top 10, if not top five running back this year, right? And whoever has him capitalized big time and is probably going to be up there in a playoff spot or, you know, possibly winning the league. So I don't want to completely maximize my, you know, my risk without taking guys like that. So if you're in multiple leagues, I would always look to diversify. Um, so we've had a lot of the rookie running backs start to go off the board. I think Josh Jacobs won as early as 3-6. I think the more we get into the offseason, the more I'm going to take a convictus, convictionist, I don't know what the fucking word is for it, 
a very convictive stance on Josh Jacobs in that he's one guy I'm absolutely fading in the third round. I, I really think we're going to look back on Josh Jacobs and be like, all the signs were there on why he wasn't going to be a good NFL running back. We've literally never seen him carry more than 120 balls in, in college. He was not even the starter. Damian Harris started over him at Alabama. He didn't catch many passes. I do think he's a good pass catcher, but he didn't catch many passes, so I want to see it. He had horrible athletic measurables, right? He ran like a 4.65 40-yard dash, if not a 4.69. Like, there are not a lot of objectively good things about Josh Jacobs, and I think we're just forcing him into this role because obviously draft capital is, is a major portion of the opportunity that a player is going to get. But outside of that, man, he has every reason to fail. And uh, I don't want to risk my third-round pick on that. I would rather, in those in those landmine uh, you know, rounds, and I talked about a lot of this. I, I, I dropped a video earlier this week about the mid-round running backs, guys in the third, fourth, fifth, sixth round. All of them come with so much risk, but the wide receivers at these spots uh, really, really are like solid options compared to the risk that you're taking. Ooh, I hope Chris Godwin falls to me right now. So we see... Let's see. So we've had two quarterbacks go off the board. Let's see where uh, Mahomes went off the board. He's finally, finally, finally dropping a little bit in leagues where he was like a second and third round pick consensus earlier in the offseason. He just went at 4-6. Again, this is the 10-team league uh, where you only start one quarterback. So he went at 4-6, which is great because I I thought that's about where you should be starting to draft him to begin with. Uh, But now that he lost to Kill, I think he's like a fifth round. I don't think he's that far above the other quarterbacks in terms of a tier, Luck, uh, Watson. So I have not drafted Chris Godwin in probably my last 25 best ball drafts. I was scooping up capital of Chris Godwin uh, when I first, first started doing my drafts on draft.com. Like as soon as 2018 ended, they opened up drafts in like February. And that's where you could really take advantage of ADPs and skewed things. And uh, you could still do that really all the way up until like mid-August. All the ADPs are screwed and you could draft great teams. But Godwin was going in like the seventh round, eighth round of best ball drafts. And then there's been so much hype around this Tampa Bay offense that you saw his ADP. It was pick 48. That was, um, that's a a top 50 pick, right? That's within the first four rounds of a 12-team league. And I get the hype. Like, I really do. But I I don't know. It's a little, I feel like you're just baking in all of the upside that he could possibly have if if you're looking at him in the fourth round. And they're saying all the right things, right? Hold on, my pick. So Godwin at 5'9", Cooper Cup 5'10", Kenyon Drake 6'1". So uh, a strategy of mine, well, yeah, I'm not going to take a quarterback or a tight end yet unless... Ah, actually, there's some pretty solid tight ends on the board. I, I feel like OJ Howard had been a perennial fourth and fifth round pick for a while. And he does scare me a little bit because the injury concern, he hasn't landed... He hasn't finished a season, not on the IR in a while. I'm actually going to pass on uh, tight end. Ah, shit. I'll go with Mike Williams. I don't have a lot of stock in him. Go, 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 go. Oh, it's going to fucking auto pick for me. It's going to take a quarterback, I bet. Come on, Draft. What you doing? I got too many programs running. Be- oh, the one motherfucker I didn't want on my team. They took Mark Ingram. I guess that's a good example. It's a perfect example of what I was talking about diversifying the revenue. I barely own any stock in Mark Ingram because his ADP is like pick 40. Right? I'm not using a third or fourth round pick on Mark Ingram. I talked about it in the Do Not Draft Running Backs video that I put out on Tuesday, which is doing fucking numbers, by the way, man. This channel is really about to blow up, and I'm really excited about it. So thank you for all the support if, if you guys have watched my videos thus far. And if you're enjoying this video thus far, as always, I would uh, very much appreciate a thumbs up on the video. And subscribe to the channel if you're new, because we're breaking down everything 2019 fantasy football from here through when the season kicks off, into the season, and then in the offseason next year when it's dynasty season. I just snagged this monster right before the video. Pretending like I needed energy to wake up, but I've already had like two giant cups of coffee. And I'm about to have severe fucking anxiety after I'm done with this. Way too much caffeine in a short period of time. It is, it, summer is here. Starting next week, yeah, this is the last day of May if you're watching this on Friday. May 31st. Starting in June, five videos a week, which means it's really, really anxiety season. Actually, when the NFL season season kicks off, that's really when the anxiety begins. 
So trying to keep track of your 16 fucking fantasy teams and ugh, now I'm going to have three dynasty teams and like five redraft teams to fucking take care of. I'm about to cry live on camera right now. Um, all right, so I want to talk about tight ends a little bit. And I brought this up earlier in this video as well as last video. Again, I have not seen, this is the first time in a while I've seen one of the top three tight ends, Kittle, Ertz, Kelsey, drop to the third round. And this is probably only because it was the, uh, yeah, now that I think about it, it's only because it's a 10-team league. 12 teamers, none of them are dropping to the third round. I think that's starting to get a little bit too expensive. I still like Kelsey. Early second round, even if you wanted to get a little cute, go late first round. I think like the target share that he's going to have, he led all tight ends with like 26% of the targets. That was with Tyree Kill being in the offense. So I can only imagine that he doesn't hit 28, 30% of the targets there um, if he's not healthy. And he could easily go for, you know, 95 catches, 1,500 yards, 10 touchdowns. So I think Kelsey is such a huge positional advantage. That I still like him where he is. But Ertz and Kittle creeping up into the early, mid-second round is too early for me. So at that point, I'm probably going to fade them because you're still going to be able to get guys like you see here. O.J. Howard, Evan Ingram in the sixth round. I'll take the five-round drop-off and pad my team with uh, you know, a, a Juju or a um, or one of those guys, Nick, Nick Chubb even, that you can get in the middle of the second round instead of one of those tight ends. Like, would you rather have... Um, would you rather have... O.J. Howard and Juju Smith-Schuster, or would you rather have, you know, D.J. Moore and Zach Ertz? Like, I would rather the the latter, or the, the former, excuse me. Um, but, like, yeah, I, I just see the tight end start creeping up, and now, like, this whole mix of a tier after the top three are really, like, in their own thing, right? It's Henry, Ingram, OJ Howard, like all going like pretty, pretty, pretty late. And I actually wanted to grab a tight end earlier where they took Mark Ingram, but I'm kind of glad they took Mark Ingram because this is to my point. I don't like Mark Ingram. I think he's going to be very much like Alex Collins. Uh, I think Justice Hill is going to be super involved. So I think he's going to turn into like a two down grinder that scores maybe six touchdowns on the ground, catches like 25 passes, which is not great for where his ADP is. Right, but I got him in the sixth round, so I'm not actually mad about that with Mark Ingram. He's not a guy I wanted necessarily, but since I don't have him on many of my teams, if he does, you know, prove me wrong and do well, I'm glad that I was able to get him, you know, in the sixth round. And Hunter Henry might fall to me right now in the seventh, which would be absolutely fantastico. Let me move my mic over a little bit. Sorry. See, this is the OBS software. So if any of you guys are content creators. Honestly, I love helping other content creators out. So if you uh, if you are in the YouTube space or if you're even in the podcast space, I have a million tips. So drop some comments down below if you are a content creator or you're trying to you know start your own thing. I would love to give you guys some tips. This is the OBS software, very customizable. This is what a lot of people use on like Twitch for streaming. You could set it up and put a, a ton of different like little assets onto the screen that make it look nice and designed. Come on, Hunter Henry. Drop to me, you bish. Let's see. Oh, man. Darius Geis falling all the way to the seventh as well. Damn, this is tough. Okay, so I want both of these guys right here. Darius Geis, Hunter Henry. I want to look at this guy's team, though, and see what he has. Okay, so he already has Travis Kelsey on his team. So it's very unlikely that within the next two picks, because it's my pick and then two of his picks, um, and then my pick again. So he has Kelsey already. It's very unlikely he takes Henry. So I'm going to roll the dice, take Darius Geis here, assuming that Hunter Henry gets back to me with my eighth round pick. Um, so Darius Geis is obviously a big injury concern going into this year. I love Darius Geis as a talent. I think he's one of the best running back prospects that we've seen in, in um, well, maybe not such a long time because the NFL has been absolutely in flux with like great running back talent over the last few years. Geis is in a messy situation, of course, though, right? The knee has not healed properly. I know there's like people putting like fucking eight second videos on Twitter about him like running through cones and shit guys that I'm, I'm telling you that is like literally not the way to do fantasy football analysis do not base your player opinions on a clip that of eight seconds that someone put on Twitter please don't do that talking about Twitter make sure you're following me because give out a lot of value through Twitter Nick underscore BDG boom perfect so Henry fell to me I will take Henry Henry's one of those guys like I want one of the top seven or eight tight ends especially if I don't get one of the top three and Henry's probably like the last guy of that tier I want. 
Uh, I like Eric Ebron. I like Jared Cook. I like Vance McDonald. I like all those guys, actually. So those aren't bad picks either, but I love Henry's normally a guy you have to pick in like the six. So I think I got very good value here. And next, oh, since next week is five videos a week, Monday's video is going to be my do not draft list for wide receivers. So I did my running back list this Tuesday. Monday is going to be do not draft for wide receivers. Wednesday is going to be the do not draft for quarterbacks and tight ends. Um, in between, I'm going to be jumping on with Noah on Tuesday videos. I think we're going to go into the biggest offensive lineman moves and changes and impacts. So his his stuff is, my stuff's going to be more general. Uh, Monday, Wednesdays are going to be very general, like basic topics. Like I said, do not draft, bus, sleepers. Uh, Tuesday, when Noah gets on the videos with me, we're going to be going into more like granular shit like that, like top offensive lineman changes and their impacts on fantasy players. Every Thursday is going to be the Fade the Public videos. You know, me, Snacks, and Animal get on. We talk about the E-Town Get Down, which is our high-stakes fantasy league. We've been in for 11 years. We went to uh, high school together. So just a bunch of ignorant shit, to be honest with you. We get on podcast for an hour, and then every Friday will be a mock draft. And twice a month from now on, starting in June, I will be going live. So I'm going to be live streaming for 30 to 45 minutes with my Patreons. Um, so that will be a private live stream. I will probably upload it maybe a, a week later or so. Um, but if you want to be part of the live stream, you know, you could ask. I'll be answering any questions that are like personal to you being on the clock or your situation. You can head over to patreon.com slash BDGE. That's where you could sign up. We have one package. It's a monthly subscription, basically. Uh, where you'll get my full dynasty rankings, you'll get my season long rankings each week, like during the season, which I don't post anywhere else. Um, you'll get these private live streams, and you'll also get access to Big Dogs Dynasty Leagues. So we have a partnership with both Flea Flicker and Team Stakes. So you can do paid dynasty leagues through Big Dogs Gotta Eat. Uh, if you sign up through patreon.com, you'll get the link to the open leagues right now. Um, there are some leagues, there's one league that's going to kick off, the first league actually is going to kick off on June 1st. So that's very exciting. It was a uh, it was, a, it was a long process to put this all together. But yeah, you get a lot with patreon.com. Um, but you will get the private live stream. So that's going to be the schedule. Five videos a week, two private live streams a month, heading into the season. Content on content on content on content. So some other picks. Uh, most of the tight ends just started going off the board. I see that. David Njoku's still on the board. I put out a stat yesterday, a wild stat. If you're not following us on Instagram, make sure you're doing that. David Njoku has yet to eclipsed 75 receiving yards in a game in his 32 career NFL games. Has not gone over 75 yards, which is crazy, crazy. Um, and listen, people like really got fucking big mad on the internet about this stat. It was nothing intentional behind it. It was just a crazy stat. I understand he came into the NFL very young and he's still super young. So I understand that the developmental curve for someone who comes in at the age of 20, 21, it's going to be long. I'm not saying David Njoku can't be good. I'm just saying through 32 games, for all the hype that he's gotten, he's never gone over 75 receiving yards. He's had three games of zero receiving yards. He's had five games of five receiving yards or less. And he's had, I think it was 15 games of 20 receiving yards or less. So he has not actually been great up to this point. But this offense should be very fun to watch. Um, adding OBJ is not necessarily like a great thing for him. But... Should just be a lot of efficiency and a lot of stuff going around in that offense. A lot of good stuff. So Baker Mayfield's still on the board here. I'll probably grab him at the 9-9 if he's, uh, if he's still open. I'm trying to get like one of the top quarterbacks within the first eight-ish rounds. Normally, I try to hit that first tier. So Mahomes, Rodgers, Watson, and Luck within like the first seven rounds. Oh, there goes Baker. Zame. I played myself. <laughs> so right now, if we're looking at my roster, you can just click your name and the roster pops up. We have Mixon, Williams, Ingram, Geis at running back. We have Devonta Adams, Keenan Allen, Chris Godwin at wide receiver, and Hunter Henry at tight end. I actually really, really, really like how this team is coming together, especially for a 10-team league. The way I look at it is because in our E-Town Get Down League, like the high-stakes league we're in with my friends from high school, it's a 10-team league. So I understand that like a lot of people will come on and be like, oh, oh God, imagine playing in a 10-team league. Like, cool. Like, you have so many fucking friends that you play in leagues with. Congratulations, my friend. Um, we play in a 10-team league because that's just how the league was and that's how it's been. So I look at those teams and sometimes they're stacked, but it's not always easy to pick a good team. So I compare these teams that I pick with those teams. And if I had drafted this team in the E-Town Get Down, I'd be very, very, very happy with it. So I'm still probably looking at skill players. I, I do want to... So 
Cortland Sutton is another guy that I wasn't necessarily high on. I didn't like him coming out as a prospect. I thought he fucking separated from defenders like fucking spaghetti separated from meatballs. But listen, Cortland Sutton, for all intents and purposes, went for 700 yards, 700 plus yards in his rookie season. Now, I know he had a lot more opportunity than most rookies get, but at the end of the day, 700 yards for a rookie season is is in the right direction, right? A lot of times these rookie wide receivers take a long time to develop. Um, it's, it, you know, when you look at the OBJs and Mike Evans, you can't just look at them and be like, that's the standard for what people need to do the rookie year in order to be really good. Like there's only been four wide receivers, I believe someone's going to have to fact check me on this, four wide receivers ever that have had a thousand receiving yards in the rookie year. And there are far more than four wide receivers ever that have been good in fantasy football. So don't take that as, as like the, the totem pole for where you need to be. Like 700 receiving yards is very, very good for a rookie. That usually means like they're ready to take the next step up. So 700 and the next year will be 900 to 1,000. And then year three is usually that like big breakout to elite status. Um, so, you know, I didn't necessarily love it again, but Cortland Sutton's going to get every opportunity to really be the guy there. Uh, I think I'm going to probably grab a quarterback here. And I still think there's a couple really solid options on the board. We'll probably go with Russ. I don't have a lot of Russ. Again, guys, I always like, don't necessarily look at all the players that I'm just taking right now and the way that my team is set up. I diversify all the time. So I just try to use these videos to give you an idea of where guys are getting picked and, and different strategies throughout the draft. So Russ is a guy that I probably haven't taken a lot of. And for the reasons that are obvious, that Schottenheimer is still there as the offense coordinator. And he just runs the ball a fucking unfathomable, an unforgivable amount of time. Seattle runs the ball. But I think you saw the locker room get a little more frustrated towards the end of the year that Russ wasn't throwing the ball. I think you saw them go out and draft DK Metcalf, Gary Jennings, you know, all of these wide receivers. Um, Tyler Lockett moving to the slot. Absolutely love that. And they gave Russ this extension, this monster extension, right? Four year, $140 million. So, you know, while Schottenheimer is still there, I think this, this spells good things for the passing game. And Russ is still obviously one of the most efficient, one of the best deep ball passers in the NFL, one of the best historically deep ball passers we've ever seen. Um, so give him a little bit more volume, and he's easily going to crack the top five fantasy quarterbacks again. And if nothing else, like he gives you a nice, consistent floor on a week to week basis, especially with the rushing ability. So, um, so Russ is a guy, you know, I'm absolutely happy taking as my QB1 in, in the 10th round of drafts. Like I said, I like getting the top elite guys, but. Uh, the, the drop off after those guys, the tier is, is huge. So there's no reason to jump at like a, I don't know, like a Drew Brees or whoever went earlier um, in like round seven when you can get a, a solid player like Tyler Boyd or something and then get Russell Wilson in the 10th. So I'll probably chill on quarterbacks for another couple rounds. I do want to get like two really solid quarterbacks. Ronald Jones off the board. So a couple interesting running backs just went off the board. We have Jalen Samuels. We have Ronald Jones. Jalen Samuels is a guy... That was in my running back sleepers video that I put out a couple months ago, like early in the offseason. And he was one of my favorite sleeper picks. And we're hearing good things out of camp. I thought that James Conner was good, but not, he wasn't like EV positive. You know, he wasn't adding anything to the passing game that another running back couldn't step in and take his place. Like, yes, he got a lot of targets. He caught a lot of balls last year and he was good in the passing game. But I think adding someone who's actually really good in the passing game would make that a special position. So I think Jalen Samuels is really going to step in and take a much bigger role in the passing game. And we saw it towards the end of last year, right? When James Conner was hurt and he missed a couple games, Jalen Samuels filled in. He has a size to be a workhorse back. He filled in great. And then the last game when James Conner was fully back, right? We saw Jalen Samuels still get like eight targets out of the backfield when James Conner was playing. I think we're going to see a little bit more of a similar split that way. And Jalen Samuels, obviously, he was a tight end in college. He was like a weapon in college. And the uh, running back's tight end coach from his college, NC State, was hired by Pittsburgh. So you're not going to find a, a, a guy who's going to come in and understand how to utilize Samuels, plus, you know, push for Samuels to be on the field more and more than this guy. So we're hearing reports of Samuels being on the field with Connor, right? They're doing like two running back sets, which is great. Like they could line Samuels up in the backfield. They could use him at tight end. They can use him out wide. And I think 
uh, you know, the, the numbers might not be necessarily pretty. Like you, you might not be able to expect, expect 15 carries and five targets a game. But I think at the end of the year, you're going to look back and be like, wow, you know, he was someone who consistently put up 10 fantasy points a game, just getting it done each and every way. So uh, I absolutely love Samuels as like a ninth, 10th, 11th round pick in best ball leagues. I've been taking a lot of him, even though he has been, he has been creeping up a little bit. They took Benny Snell. Um, and I actually was kind of thankful for that because Benny Snell, when he was drafted, Benny Snell's like James Conner. It was basically like a worse version of James Conner, in my opinion. Um, so that kind of pushed Jalen Samuels' ADP back. I saw him kind of creeping up almost to like the end of the eighth round in these drafts, right? And as soon as Benny Snell was taken, now he's back to like the 10th, 11th round. So he, now I feel comfortable again taking him. And then Ronald Jones went off the board right after him. Ronald Jones getting a lot of hype. Um, and I don't really like to, th- I, I, I really could care less about like, the stuff that happens through OTAs, honestly, there's no pads on. Anyone who's like a good athlete, anyone who's really fast and springy like Ronald Jones is, is going to look really good in those. Um, but, you know, I will take notice. If, if these are the only reports that are going to come out and they're going to come out every two days and they're going to say how good he looks, like at some point when they're, when there's smoke, there's fire. But again, you, you, they can't lie to us once preseason starts. Um, once the starting roster is on the field, once the starting team is on the field, we'll see how the snaps are split up between Peyton Barber, between Ronald Jones, um, it should be on paper, prolific offense. We'll see how true that is. Uh, I put out a wild stat yesterday on my Instagram. Again, um, I'm on the clock right now, actually. So we had Davis, Jackson, Jordan Howard, Jared Goff, Larry Fitz go off 11-4 to 11-8. I have four running backs, four wide receivers. Let's see who's left at the quarterback position. Uh, I think Carson Wentz is an absolute steal all the way down here. And uh, if I go with Carson Wentz here, which I will, then I'll be set at the quarterback position. I, uh, I'm i of the mindset of drafting two quarterbacks in these best ball leagues. Two good quarterbacks, though. I don't want to draft, you know, Russell Wilson and then try to rely on Sam Darnold or Jimmy Garoppolo. Yes, both of them have a chance of being very good this year, but I would much rather have a second quarterback that I'm comfortable with. So I'll draft two quarterbacks, feel good about it, and then move on from the position. Uh, and that's usually what I'll do with tight ends too. Sometimes I go with three tight ends if I don't get one of the elite guys, which I didn't. I only got Hunter Henry. So we'll have to kind of circle back. Um, I'm going to leave that on the board. So I'm going to look at skill players right now and see who is the... Sorry, man. This, this software is kind of moving slow because I have so much running on my computer. Uh, man, we're moving quick. You know what? I kind of like Terry Kill. I, I mean, I don't like Terry Kill and I don't like drafting him at all, but... What the fuck, man? They took Jarek McKinnon. God damn it. I have absolutely zero Jarek McKinnon draft picks. Um, unless I timed out and the computer took it for him. He's still not back from his knee. I don't see him being a key piece of that backfield. I think Matt Breed is a better running back than him. And I think Tevin Coleman will be forced into a bigger role than him. So I just, you know, I want no part of McKinnon. <clears throat> um, well, I guess it's not bad because I don't own any pieces of him. I wanted Tariq Kill here. So what I was going to say about Tariq Kill is he's in a messy situation. It's very possible he doesn't play at all this year. But I would give it like a coin flip that he does play again for the Chiefs this year. The fact that they didn't just come out and cut him outright tells you that if he doesn't get suspended for the year, he's coming back to the Chiefs. Like with Kareem Hunt, they just cut him. Why would Terry Kill just be banned indefinitely and not cut if they didn't plan on playing him if he doesn't get the suspension? Or if his suspension is only eight games? So I think Terry Kill in the 12th round, even if he gets an eight-game suspension, it could be longer. Again, if he gets an eight-game suspension, you're getting him from weeks nine through 16. You're getting Terry Kill for eight games in the 12th round. So I'm okay with that because there's no one here that like you really feel great about having. Um, maybe that means that you do end up drafting an extra wide receiver on your team. Because again, these rosters are 18 players deep, right? So you're obviously going to end up with you know, multiple quarterbacks, multiple tight ends, probably between five and eight running backs and five and eight wide receivers. And the way I divvy it up is I look at, you know, if I have three awesome running backs, then I'll probably only take five or six running backs total and I'll have seven or eight wide receivers. But if like three of my first four picks were wide receivers and I have a really strong core there, then I'll go the opposite way. And maybe I'll go six or seven running backs and six or seven wide receivers. So it's really just looking at your team overall and seeing how to divvy it up. And uh, starting on June 1st, I think this might be the first time I've officially announced it, but uh, Big Dogs, our brand, has signed an official partnership with Draft. 
which is fucking awesome because this is a platform that I've been using. If you follow me, I've been using Draft for like literally two years now. I've been doing content for them for two years without actually having any kind of contact or partnership with them. Um, but I will be creating content for them and we have an official partnership starting June 1st. So throughout this season, we got that partnership, baby. And it's thanks to y'all for supporting me as always, man. You give me a lot of motivation to do the shit that I do and I couldn't be thankful enough. <clears throat> um, that being said, I'm going to try to get some, um, some of the information, the backend stuff that they have in their system in terms of, you know, winning percentages with roster constructions. And um, if I can get that from them, I'm not sure, you know, how available it is for them to kind of give off to me. But if they can, you know, give me the roster constructions of all the, the teams that won last year, I can give you winning percentages based on certain roster constructions like teams that won teams that drafted three tight ends instead of two, like what their winning percentage was. So stay tuned for that. I'm going to try to get that, uh, that information from them. Um, and, and then I can actually give you more like big facts. Cause you know, in my regular videos, I love to break shit down as granular as I could possibly get, but with these best balls, it's kind of just like my opinion, right? Because I don't really have enough stats and, and numbers to back up what I'm saying as tried and true forms of, of winning best ball leagues. So I'm looking forward to that. I also have someone that I think I'm going to bring on to the Big Dogs team as a full-time, not a full-time, but as a, uh, a best ball specialist niche writer, so a blogger, who's going to be putting out content specific to best ball. Um, smart dude, Steven, we're still talking, we're still negotiating things, um, but look forward to that as well. So best ball is just something you guys should really, really get into. It's a lot of fun, man. It's just a way to stay engaged and stay focused throughout the offseason. Uh, oh man. So Kareem Hunt and Tariq Hill just went back to back 13, four, 13, five. I would rather have Tariq Hill. Um, I, I really don't know what to make of this Kareem Hunt situation. By the time Hunt comes back in week nine, when is the, the Browns bye week? I don't know off the top of my head. Let me check. So he'll be out for... First eight weeks. Okay, they have their buy in week seven. So I'm not sure if he misses the first eight games or the first eight weeks. I'm assuming it's the first eight games. So he would probably be back week 10 against Buffalo. Also, I'm going to have to get fact checked on that. Uh, Dallas Goddard just went off the board. So Buffalo Steelers, Miami Steelers, Bengals, Cardinals. It's a pretty light schedule to come back to. Uh, I just am very, very, very worried about the workload that they're going to give them. Um, let's see. So let's look at the team we have right now. I think we're like really solid at the skill players all around. What kind of tight ends they still got on the board? I'm pissed Dallas Goddard just got taken. I'm going to take Chris Herndon because I don't have very many shares of him. He was someone I was super high on. Um, Entering the offseason, and then they made a lot of moves that I don't necessarily love for Chris Herndon's outlook. What I will say is he had a very good rookie year relative to other tight end rookie years. 500 receiving yards is just the 12th time over the last 20 years that a rookie has had 500 receiving yards or more. Um, the problem, too, is we don't really know what type of athlete Chris Herndon is. Supposedly, he's a very good athlete, but he had knee surgery like right before or during his senior season, or his last season in college at, at Miami. First of all, he was buried behind David Njoku. He didn't get the test because of the knee the the knee problems. Okay, so Caitlin Blage and Peyton Barber just went off the board. Uh, those are two guys I was probably actually looking at. Um, a couple of the guys that I don't have much stock in that I do want to look at a little deeper, Paris Campbell, Tyrell Williams for sure. Actually, I've been saying to a lot of people that I want to get some more Tyrell Williams stock, but he just kept going in like the 10th, 11th round. So down in the 14th, I like that a lot. This is an offense that should throw the ball a lot, right? Not everything is going to go to Antonio Brown. Derek Carr takes a lot of deep balls, deep shots. Um, I was listening to the Fantasy Footballers podcast a couple days ago, and they, they had brought up a stat about Derek Carr that like, I can't remember the exact stat. I'm sure one of you guys listens to them and, and could probably fact check this in the comment section. I think it was like over the last five years, Derek Carr has had two of the top three most accurate deep ball seasons. Season seasons, which is crazy considering, I don't know, you just don't think of Derek Carr that way. But if that's true. I mean, Terrell Williams is a beautiful fit. They just add a lot of speed to this offense between Terrell Williams, Antonio Brown, J.J. Nelson, 
supposedly Darren Waller is the next Jared Cook. I have no idea what that's about, but probably someone to look into in Dynasty. Um, Matt Breida in the 14th round, I'm smashing the, the cop button on if, uh, if I need a running back as well. So there's a lot of these second-year guys that are in, in good positions to break out as well. Um, but as I was saying about Paris Campbell, uh, I like Paris Campbell. I think a lot of people are really, really high in Campbell. Like I've seen Paris Campbell go as high as the 103 in rookie drafts, which is way too fucking high. 105 is the absolute earliest I would even look at Paris Campbell because I have the three rookie running backs, DeMont, Sanders, Jacobs, and Nikhil Harry. Um, so they're like in their own tier. But Paris Campbell's a guy that ridiculous athleticism, didn't break out until his last year at college, which is definitely a concern. Breakout age is a monster factor in terms of predicting NFL success. But he's got the draft capital. He's in a great position. There are a lot of mouths to feed in Indy, though. Still, I mean, they're going to run the ball a lot with Marlon Mack. He had plenty of games with over 20 carries. They are going to be throwing the ball to their tight ends. As Andrew Luck, like 27% of his targets always go to the tight ends. Eric Ebron, hopefully a healthy Jack Doyle. They bring in Devin Funchess. They obviously have T.Y. Hilton there. Deion Kane, who they absolutely love, who I'm probably going to take with my 18th round pick here, um, should be back from his ACL tear. So like there are a lot of mouths to feed. So to predict Campbell for anything really more than like 50 catches and 500, 600 yards and like four touchdowns, I think you're you're kind of fooling yourself there. So uh, it's not a guy I necessarily love when you have guys like Traquan, you have Gallup, um, even John Brown, Deshaun Hamilton, I think should be a PPR stud. I think those guys are not as exciting as Paris Campbell, because Paris Campbell's a new rookie with a lot of buzz, but I would be shocked if all those guys didn't put up just as good, if not better, actual stats than Paris Campbell. That's the other thing. Um, and I talked about this. I wrote down some some things that I learned, or some things you know that I've learned this offseason, especially for Dynasty Leagues. When you're drafting in Dynasty Leagues, and this is actually for um, season-long leagues as well, but some of the rookie hype dies down by the time you actually draft at the end of August, early September— Rookies just get so much hype, right? We don't have football for three or four months. So we just hear the same rookie names for three or four months when we're not hearing any other names. So those guys get ingrained into you and you start loving the hype around them. The thing is, most rookie wide receivers, just like tight ends, don't really produce much statistically in their first year. So their value drops a little bit. You're like, oh, you know, he didn't produce much, whatever. You're not thinking about him as highly as you were when they were hyped. So while the rookie wide receivers hype and buzz is at an all-time high and their value in order to, to select them in dynasty drafts is higher than most sophomores, sophomores are one year closer to where the normal breakout age is, right? So while they didn't produce last year, their value is down. So you can get them at a lesser draft cost. You know what I'm saying? Like, all right, let's look at Traquan Smith. Let's look at Michael Gallup. And let's look at Deshaun Hamilton. And I want you guys to try to be as objective as you possibly can. Uh, there goes Deshaun. And Michael Gallup went off the board. Uh, I'll probably look at... What are the wide receivers we got? Yeah, all these guys down here are more like risky with upside and not necessarily like actual producers yet. So I want to look at their rookie season numbers. And I want to see like realistically, do you think Paris Campbell will top these numbers? Like how much better do you think he'll be? Um... Traquan, John Brown, man, I like John Brown a lot as a receiver, but he is always uh, someone who has that health risk. Traquan still has Ted Ginn there. I like John Brown. He's someone that I don't have enough of, and it's the end of the 15th round, so he's a proven wide receiver in the NFL. I don't like Josh Allen as a thrower. Okay, they took Traquan Smith anyways. Cool. Um, I guess it's kind of interchangeable there. I don't like Josh Allen whatsoever as a thrower, but he is someone that is not afraid to chuck the ball deep. He actually led the NFL last year in terms of percentage of his throws that went for, uh, percentage of his throws that were deep passes, 19%. Nine, it was like 19.5%. No other quarterback had a higher percentage, obviously. I mean, that's a, that's a ridiculously high number. So I'm going to look at my team right now and see. I have six wide receivers. I have five running backs. Where do I need more help at? I probably need more help at running backs. Because we have a bunch of risky guys right now. Who do we have at running back that we actually like? Eh, fucking nobody. I don't hate Devin Singletary. I don't hate Mike Davis. I'm going to go with Singletary. Singletary is an interesting case. He was their third round pick. Uh, he was the Bills third round pick. I believe he was the fourth or fifth running back off the board this year. Okay. They're just not going to let me pick at all. 
Cool. So while you're doing draft, uh, the app I've literally never had a problem with. There's never any delay or any glitches or any problems with it. So do your drafts on the app. I never do it on the website unless I am, uh, unless I'm actually streaming this for you guys. But if you are, make sure you make your pick a couple seconds before it hits the zero. Or make sure you don't have a lot of software running in the background because it's slowing my computer down. I have like seven. I'm actually going to show you the setup I got right now. This is my desk setup. It's an absolute mess. Like, look how many wires I got plugged into the back of this shit. So, as you can see, there's, there's, there's not a lot of room for, uh, for my computer to be running quickly. Because it just has so much horsepower going on. Um, so, yeah, just keep an eye on that. With these fast drafts, there are 30 seconds of pick. So you kind of got to know what you're going on. And I'm obviously talking to you guys for like an hour straight. So it's extremely hard to pay attention to both. I'm actually going to exit draft.com real quick and then get back in there. So Traquan, 28 for 27, 5. Um, 28 receptions. It's only 13 games. So probably more like 35 receptions, 500 yards, six touchdowns if he plays 16, which are, you know, those are like r realistically decent rookie numbers. Like I would, I, I don't think Paris Campbell will be that much higher than that. Michael Gallup, 33, 502. Deshaun Hamilton, 30 for 243 and two in only seven games. That's pretty goddamn good numbers. Damn. Deshaun Hamilton is another guy that I'm really liking a lot more. Where are you? I'm up in eight picks. Um, so in seven games, Deshaun Hamilton, obviously he took over for Emmanuel Sanders and Case Keenum was there as their quarterback who targets the slot like literally no other quarterback does. But if you pace those numbers out, I'm going to pace them out right now for you guys. 45, 30, 243, and two. Over a 16 game pace. So we have 45 times 16 divided by seven. That's 103 targets, 30, nearly 70 receptions, 555 receiving yards, and five touchdowns. So 70, 555, and five. Those would be really good rookie numbers. Um, and I saw, I think Matt Harmon of Yahoo, if you guys don't know who he is, he does, uh, he does reception perception, and he breaks down wide receivers like no other. He thinks Deshaun Hamilton is going to go for 90-plus receptions this year. I think that's very, very ballsy, a very bold pick, because there's a, it, it, there's a lot of mouths to feed in an offense that's not necessarily going to produce very much. It's Joe Flacco. They have Cortland Sutton. They have Deshaun Hamilton. They have Tim Patrick. We'll see if Emmanuel Sanders even makes it back. He's old, coming off a serious lower leg injury I would highly doubt he really makes an impact this year Philip Lindsay Royce Freeman like they got a lot of players there um so I'm not necessarily sure outside of Case Keenum like if Joe Flacco is really going to target the slot that much so 17 18th round is where I look at my quarterbacks and tight ends um well they auto picked a uh, quarterback for me Mitch Trubisky which I guess I don't hate I don't really own too much and I'll say like Hunter Henry Chris Herndon mm, do I want to take a third tight end maybe not right now I'll see who's left on the board um I don't hate de taking Devontae Parker this late either. It's really fucked up. I like Mike Davis too. Fuck it. Everyone has completely forgotten about Mike Davis since they took David Montgomery. And it makes sense. I mean, he's not going to play over, over David Montgomery. But um, I, I think David Montgomery, who I think is a great pick in, in best ball leagues right now too, because he's I, I don't think his ADP has caught up to him. I think he'll be an early fourth round pick by summer drafts. But you can still get him late fourth, fifth round, sometimes even sixth round in these. Um, and I really think that the way they're going to use him is in the three down featured workhorse role. And I think, um, I'm not scared about Tariq Cohen. I think they're going to use Tariq Cohen creatively as a weapon, not to like spell David Montgomery. I don't know how efficient Montgomery is going to be, but I think the volume is going to be really high. So if something happens, I, I think Mike Davis will be involved too. I think he's going to be like a change of pace. I wouldn't be surprised if he gets, you know, eight touches a game. Um, and probably scores some some touchdowns on the goal line. But if something happens to David Montgomery, I think Mike Davis fits in right into that workhorse role. Ooh, I wanted to get Marquise Brown there. Alexander Madison, Darwin Thompson. I'll grab, uh, I've actually grabbed a lot of Jalen Richard with my last round pick as well. Um, 
because I really am not sold on Jacobs being a three down workhorse there. And Jalen Richard is just such a big piece of their passing offense for whatever reason. I'm going to go to Alexander Madison here. I don't like him as a prospect. I really don't. Um, I don't think he's going to eat into Dalvin Cook's workload whatsoever. But obviously, Dalvin Cook has not been able to prove himself to be the healthiest. And if he were to go down with an injury, I mean, obviously, Latavius Murray is gone. So Madison kind of steps into that workhorse role immediately. Um, and we'll have to see how much of a role he does play. I don't think it's going to be that heavily. I think Cook is going to get 20, 25 touches a game. But maybe I'm wrong. And maybe he has like a Latavius Murray type role while Cook is on the field. Um, if that's the case, then Madison is going to put up plenty of good games on his own, right? And maybe take some goal line work uh, out of uh, Dalvin Cook's hands. So I believe the roster is done with right now. I'm trying to see my team. Where my team at, though? What up, though? All right, so this is the final roster, actually. So we have uh, Russ, Carson Wentz, and Trubisky as my quarterbacks. I love that stack. Uh, I'm, I'm very, very um, optimistic that one of those guys will be a top five quarterback on any given week. And we have Joe Mixon, Damian Williams, Mark Ingram, Darius Geis, McKinnon, Mike Davis, Alexander Madison at running back. So I went with seven running backs, six wide receivers. And like I said, I try to choose that like as I'm going on because I have a little more confidence in my wide receivers. Devontae Adams, Keenan Allen, Chris Godwin, Cortland Sutton, Terrell Williams, Traquan Smith. Um, the bottom half I'm not too confident in actually, to be honest with you. But the top half is heavy. But you do start three wide receivers. So it actually might be more of your advantage to go more heavy on the wide receiver side. And I think that is that I have seen some people pull numbers because MFL does best ball drafts as well. And some people will get access to those numbers, like the guys at Roto Grinders, I want to say, and Fantasy Insiders. And I, I believe like the, the ideal lineup has seven, if not eight wide receivers. But this is just how it ended up. I'll have plenty of teams with eight wide receivers and whatnot. Uh, the tight end position, I probably could have handled a little bit better. But um, I, I feel like I tried to draft someone and then the clock timed out but I ended up with Hunter Henry and Chris Herndon Hunter Henry should be a, a in every week top 10 tight end if he could stay healthy and he came back last year in their playoff game so he'll be 100% for this season and uh yeah that's that's I think that's all the video I got for today so drop any any questions you guys have um I, I feel like I ask questions throughout the video that I can't remember what they are but drop any comments you got down below if you are new to the channel make sure you subscribe we're gonna be doing videos like this every friday as well as a bunch of other informational videos throughout the week if you thought this stuff was valuable if you thought you know these stats were good go cop the big dogs draft guide bigdogsdraftguide.com it's got my top 250 big board rankings positional rankings by tier top sleepers top bust must draft players the big dogs bible it's like an 8,000 word thing breaking down every position in your draft ppr half ppr standard accessible tablet mobile desktop every way it's literally everything you need for your fantasy football season um go cop that at bigdogsdraftguide.com you can get it for 20 percent off the pre-order price drops july 1st hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed the video and i will see y'all on monday with the wide receivers to avoid or do not draft goodbye